Hello and welcome. I'm very pleased to be here this morning with Brother Kevin Cauley, who is going to speak on behalf of the organization Edmund Rice International at the intersection of several areas uh, uh, that come into his personal area of expertise. And we are gathering today in the context of the 67th UN Commission on the Status of Women. And the theme for this, this year's Commission on the Status of Women is technology, innovation, digital education, and how all of these intersect or affect our global journey toward gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. And so uh, today we'll speak with Kevin about where his area of expertise meets up with these themes and get some insights from his many years of experience. So Kevin, thanks so much for being here with us. It's always a joy to speak with you. And I'd love if we could just start off um, by asking you to offer a few words of introduction to yourself. Uh, before we dive into our conversation. Well, thank you, Teresa. And thank you to JCOR for uh, putting this all together. Um, as Teresa has said, my name is Kevin Cawley. I'm an Edmund Rice Christian brother. Uh, we were founded in Ireland in 1802 and have been educators for the better part of the two and a half centuries or so since then. And in this case, uh, we're working at the, uh, the nexus, as they say, of uh, a lot of intersecting concerns. Uh, ERI is our initial, so we work in that space. And this group was founded by the, the brothers a few years ago, I'm going to say 2005, when we began to see that, uh, yes, it's very good to be educating people, and it's very good to be uh, building up uh, the young people, but there's still a problem somewhere that the, the, the problems of the planet seem to keep coming from upstream somewhere. And so the idea was that let's examine what might be the potential for having Edmund Rice International apply this charism at the uh, United Nations. And of course, we were led to this decision by the wonderful example of women religious who have been at as we say, at the work for many, many years. And it was helpful to know that we weren't gonna to have to break new ground in the sense that uh, a lot of the early work has already been done. And I'm grateful always for the wonderful reception that the religious women did uh, in offering us a space and giving us, even for a while, we were uh, getting um, badges of entry from different religious congregations. I, was a, I started my life here as an intern for the Presentation Sisters, that's how, that's how we got launched. Um, Edmund Rice International's uh, foundation is based on the charism of Blessed Edmund, who worked out of, uh, I guess, three main uh, ideas, the presence with the poor, uh, compassion for what their circumstances were, and then the effort to liberate them by educating them. So that's our mantra, so to speak, compassion and presence and liberation. We focus uh, our efforts generally in Geneva, at the Human Rights Council, because we felt that that would be the best application of our resources. We don't have enormous resources, but we do have some energy and some interest. So we look at the rights of the child, naturally, and we look at the right to education and care of Earth, because you can educate all you want, but if the Earth is not going to be livable, then what have you done? So that's our, our sort of three-legged stool. And we have a number of brothers, or at this point, four brothers living in community in uh, Geneva, actually in France on the French side, and one brother, myself, working in New York at the headquarters of the UN, uh, still, uh, although a, a part-time assignment, I have other assignments, this is a, a piece of what I'm doing. So that's our opening, and that's our effort, and that's what we, uh, we hope to be spending our energies on, and I'll put it back in Teresa's direction for her questions. Thanks so much for that introduction, Kevin. 
good to get situated in your history. And I'd never heard that about uh, working through other congregations who are already established um, to learn about the UN and uh, to kind of use that as a pathway to creating your own space and your own presence. Um, that's a great story, especially to acknowledge the leadership of women, uh, mm. because once again, as we mentioned earlier, as we're speaking now, people from around the world are meeting at UN headquarters for the Commission on the Status of Women, which is, of course, the UN conference dedicated to gender equity and dedicated to empowerment and leadership of women and girls. Um, so in one of your other roles um, that you alluded to just a moment ago uh, is that you are the executive director of the Thomas Berry Forum for Ecological Dialogue at Iona University. And from that role, and I imagine from a few others, I know that you have cultivated a very deep personal expertise in the issue of climate change and ecosystem destruction in general. Um, so given this year's uh, theme uh, of gender and technology, I wonder if you could help us kind of see some of the links here between your area of expertise uh, and some of the concerns of the conference by perhaps commenting briefly on what are the, the gender related impacts of climate change? Thank you, Teresa. Yes, I, I think uh, a nice entry point for us, at least for me, would be uh, to refer directly to uh, a recent event that happened uh, around the uh, uh, CSW, uh, in particular the Good Shepherd Sisters and their companions who sponsored a webinar the other day about women and girls and technology. And struck me, uh, first of all, I was hugely impressed by uh, the young women who basically ran the webinar. These are, I say young women, I don't want to say girls, but they were 15 years old, 16 years old, and maybe slightly older. Uh, but they had the poise and the uh, uh, sustainable presence to carry the whole event. Uh, there were some adults, as we say, in the room, but they weren't necessary. I thought uh, it was a very impressive piece. And they also were uh, very comfortable with the technology that they had at hand and used a very, I thought, clever and lively innovations to move the topics. So uh, I must say, uh, it cheers me to know that that's possible. I'm also in a, from a large family and we had seven children and uh, I have 11 nieces and nephews and they have children. And it's wonderful to watch how parents deal with children. And for the beginning of this process, uh, I think my brother, his first five grandchildren were all girls. So of course he was in heaven, five granddaughters. But I'm watching them and watching how their moms work. And I'm watching it now play out here with these young women who I was watching on the, the, uh, the webinar the other day. Sadly, what I noticed right away and was put to their point some of them had wonderful access to technology and were, in a sense, surrounded by it. And in a sense, like the fish in the water, swimming in it. While others were enormously behind, in a sense. And there were some poignant moments where uh, some of the young women with technology were speaking to their sisters in other parts of the world. And a school with uh, basically a computer for every person in the school, talking to a school with maybe 200 girls in the school and three computers. That's a terrible inequality and it, it marked the inequality that's also present in many other dimensions. But certainly that was one for me that was a very stark reminder of the gulf that uh, still exists. So uh, on the one hand, <clears throat> yes, it's happy, happy, times for many young women because of the technology available. And also having been traveling a lot in my original work with the Evan Rice International to about, I guess, about 30 countries, uh, watching the growth of the mobile phone <clears throat> in places that don't have even paved roads or electricity. But the mobile phone is ubiquitous and helping a lot of people. So I was 
uh, watching that and saying, I hope that that continues, but also to be conscious of the fact that uh, we still have enormous gaps. Uh, one of the things that uh, came up uh, recently in some of the work I was doing was uh, in human trafficking and the ability, the inability, for, it seems to me, for us to, to make a dent in this horrendous scourge. And generally speaking, overwhelmingly, uh, the victims are young women. And uh, the, the struggles we still have with that and the, I'm going to have to call it the gender bias of the planet. Uh, even I think it's UNICEF's recent notices were about 25% of women alive today were child brides. Uh, that's a disturbing fact to, to be carrying around, uh, even for me, who's uh, uh, sort of on the way, in a sense, to another kind of life. But that's a scary idea that that's still true. And also to know that in terms of uh, climate and the ability to, as we say, draw down the carbon, one of the uh, projects that's come up lately has been this group called Drawdown. And their work has been to try to identify those places in the economies of the planet where we can draw down, literally, the amount of carbon and reduce the impact of carbon on the atmosphere, which we know is the main cause of our difficulties. And they listed a hundred solutions to the carbon problem. And they, they, they sort them out for you. So you can look at the top 10 and, and, it's, and a surprise one is that number six on the list is the education of the girl child. And they've done, as we say, they did the math. And if you educate the girl child, and this is educate the girl child, meaning through the 12th year of school, so K to 12, uh, you will actually uh, end up with uh, four to five fewer children per girl, per woman, at the end of that process, which means uh, fewer mouths to feed, fewer uh, obligations on the woman, also uh, healthier moms because they're not exhausted from childbearing and the chance for those children to become uh, educated, successful, literate, and independent. All of that uh, works out uh, in a, pardon me, a, a math problem about carbon. That's much less uh, carbon intensive when you have educated the girl child. And some places are better at this than others. And we know that the, the disparities about this, the inequalities about this are pervasive. Right now, I'm going to use my own country, USA. It's about 18 tons of carbon per year per person. That's our contribution, if you'll pardon the expression. Whereas, you know, places like Madagascar, it's 0.1 tons per person per year. India is 1.8 tons per person per year. It's a magnitude of difference. And that's part of the challenge that the, uh, pardon me, the technologically advanced are also uh, the carbon intensive. And that's a disturbance that uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to fix that, but we need to pay attention to it. The other question uh, around women and girls and the climate uh, has to do with the question of water. And uh, I know a number of us have worked in uh, the mining working group over the years, which is really not the mining working group in a sense, it's really the water working group as we know. It ends up being about water because of the intensive uh, use of water in the extractive industries and um, the, the challenges and the struggles of uh, the right, the human right to water and sanitation, which made it into the sustainable development goals, as we know. But a huge proportion of women in the developing world spend a great part of their day getting water, carrying water, fetching water, saving water, conserving water. And for many families, the, the first child, the girl child, that becomes their job. Instead of school, they end up being the water carriers. That uh, is an affliction and it holds back so many. So the question of uh, human right to water and sanitation is, is real. And it brings us to Laudato Si, uh, Pope Francis's encyclical on the, the care of earth and uh, maybe it's not obvious, but he talks about water 
all through that document. He's, he mentions water 47 times in an encyclical about care of the earth. He's very aware of that problem. And I know that when we were working in the mining working group, a number of us, I think, uh, were engaged in trying to get that message somehow to the Holy Father as he was doing his documents. And obviously he was paying attention to a lot of people and that's how it showed up so often. But it's a clear issue that uh, the, the moving of water and the fact that women are in, in many places, the place, the person that, that has to take care of it. That's a, a disturbing fact. It did not show up in the technology question, but it's certainly uh, an example of that's not the technology you want to depend on. A 10 year old girl bringing water to keep the family alive. That's, that's really not where we should be on that. So there's a, an, in a sense, a challenge to where's the technology that will help us with that. Uh, I'll stop for a minute. Maybe you have another. Yeah, that's a, a fascinating uh, framing that you have there at the end that kind of the, the, the old or maybe original technology, if you will, for meeting our basic needs as humans was basically to make women the machinery. Um, and rather than, you know, being able to pursue lives of empowerment or, or being kind of full human beings who are the ones um, steering the machine or driving the machine. Um, so much of women's and girls' energy throughout history has been just dedicated to being the machinery um, that keeps everything else running. And that's just a really uh, a fascinating way of seeing it in the context of this, this conversation of technology. Um, while we're on the subject of Laudato Si, um, which for anyone who may not know, um, was uh, an encyclical or in other words, a letter to the world that was published by Pope Francis in 2015. And in that letter, he was specifically inviting the entire world into climate action um, and brought up many of the issues to which Kevin has already made reference. Um, but he also does some, some specific mention, uh, as you said, not, he doesn't connect it to gender, um, but there is some, some time and some pages dedicated to commenting on how technology or, or, or digital innovation are affecting us as a human population and how they are affecting the planet for better or worse. Um, I wondered if you could just comment a bit on how technology itself or what we sometimes you know, think of as technological advancement uh, is, is commented on in Laudato Si. Thanks, uh, Teresa, yes. Well, it's, uh, it's no surprise that uh, Francis would be looking at that question. As a matter of fact, the, the chapter three uh, of Laudato, the human roots of the ecological crisis, he has about 40 paragraphs uh, opening this this question, uh, and he's, he's pretty harsh, I think, for a good chunk of it, because I think he sees the inequality question here. As we said before, you know, the, the, even the young women on the call, the inequality was obvious in the different places that they were talking to. But he, if you'll pardon me to, to actually use his language here, technology uh, linked to business interests is often presented as the only way of solving the problem. But it, it's, as he says, it's, it's incapable of seeing the mysterious network of relations between things. And so sometimes solves one problem only create others. I mean, that's, we can see that every day in our own world. He talks about the, uh, the wonderful Apetacita document that came out of the, the Amazon Synod and where the interests of economic groups, which demolish sources of life uh, and they don't look at the natural resources. They just decide that technology is going to be the answer. Sometimes it means just building three more dams. So then we have electricity, but you forget the, what's been destroyed in the building of the three dams. And, and you know, a lot of water defenders in different parts of the world uh, have made it clear that uh, outside interests uh, need to be challenged when you're dealing with uh, the water in the local area, the, there's some very sad, just an anniversary just passed of the, the, the assassination of uh, uh, 
at least one more defender uh, in uh, in Honduras, uh, and that uh, intervention uh, has ever has really not yet been, in a sense, investigated fully. So Berta Torres uh, uh, lost her life defending water in her own place. Now the technology question shows up again. Uh, I'll use. Francis's language, the basic problem goes even deeper. It is the way that humanity has taken up technology and its development according to, as he says, an undifferentiated and one dimensional paradigm. This paradigm exalts the concept of a subject who using logical and rational procedures progressively approaches and gains control over an external object. It can't just be technology. It does a lot of good but it's not the only answer. And the difficulty is uh, this allows us, as he says, to accept the idea of uh, infinite or unlimited growth on a finite planet. Um, and, and we can hear it today. We can hear, even here in the developed world, uh, the solution will be a technical solution. Technology will get us out of this problem. And you can see it even when you have uh, pardon me, the partisan politics in, in this particular context. Oh, well, we can, we can solve this with more technology. Uh, you're getting lots of uh, back and forth on uh, wind power, and solar power, and nuclear power. Uh, don't worry, we'll get this solved with our technology. And those of us who've watched this for quite a while now are disturbed deeply because we know that uh, technology can be helpful, but we don't have that kind of time. Uh, the climate is changing on its own clock and our clock is too slow. So for us to say, let's relax, don't worry, we'll solve it uh, with technology is a, it's a, the moral hazard there is we're gonna allow too much to pass, too much time to pass. And they'll be looking at our grandchildren or in my case, nieces and nephews, and they'll say, uh, what, what did you do when you knew? And that's not a, a comfortable position to be in. And I have had these, some of these beautiful people come to me in family gatherings and they'll sidle up and they'll have a, a child. Everybody's got a child now, they're all little babies. And they'll lean over and they'll say, Uncle Kevin, are we gonna be okay? Now, I used to say, yeah, we'll be okay. You know, we'll figure it out. And I don't say that anymore. My answer now is, it depends. It's not comforting, but it's, I think it's honest. So we're, we're in a position now to say, uh, we don't have the kind of time that people think we have. And the more we look at it, the more we realize, that even with the, the UN efforts and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, another one is coming out shortly before the next COP, 28, uh, they have been massaged by governments, by corporations, by pressure. And each of the Conference on the Parties on Climate, each gathering has been attended by more and more corporate interests. There are larger and larger numbers. I remember being at the UN, I'm sorry to say this is a long time ago, 15 years ago, uh, and I, I started to see corporate logos in the Ecosoc chamber. And I thought, what, what is happening? Why is Mercedes Benz here at this conference? You know, why is Ferrero chocolate here at this conference on nutrition? Those were, you know, intimacy, intimations, I say, of, of something has shifted. And now we're seeing uh, hundreds of fossil fuel lobbyists at conferences on climate change. That has got to disturb people, but apparently it hasn't disturbed people enough to say they shouldn't be here. And they have realized that business interests realize they have, now that they're at the table, they're influencing everything. And they're influencing the IPCC pronouncements to the point that the IPCC has been, I'm not gonna say wrong, but they've been too careful. So when they do follow-up studies now about the predictions, when will, let's say the Antarctic start to really lose ice? When will, for example, the Amazon start to shift over to savanna instead of uh, rainforest? We're now realizing we're about 
uh, 80 years off and when those things will happen. It's happening in a sense, 75 or 80 years ahead of schedule, whatever our schedule was. Uh, that has to be dis disturbing, alarming. I don't hear the alarm bells going off, but I know that that's what's happened. I'm watching it because that's my work and it's not easy to talk about it, but it is real. So Francis is right that the technological solution is not the answer. And he's right about the human beings. And he's right about Catholic social teaching, which pushes, pushes first the common good, and then all else follows. And the fact that even now in a, in a Catholic tradition, uh, they've never really, in a sense, gave free reign, free reign to the idea of private property. The common destination of all goods is still part of that teaching. It's not for you or for me, it's for all of us. And that's a lesson that we have yet to take on board. And I think that's really part of our, our discovery here, even watching this CSW in particular, where women have known that forever. It's in, it's in you, you know? And when the CSW happens, it's always great because it's always front and center. Inequalities, inequalities, inequalities. What's wrong with this picture? Uh, just about everything is wrong with this picture. But we have to address it. We have to address it. And we have to begin to take steps for it. So I, I'm happy to say that uh, I'm encouraged by what I see and what I hear in the, in the face of what I'm learning, which is not good news. But the good news is people are paying attention. Thanks. I'm, I'm really uh, resonating with the, the idea that we are now in an era that calls for radical honesty uh, about the nature of the problem, the depth of the problems that we face in terms of climate change, um, and that you know we're not we're not going to address them quickly enough if we're um, content to to comfort ourselves and to be easily comforted, because uh, the truth is is uncomfortable, <laughs> um, and you know sometimes when we think of the idea of technology, the first thing that we imagine is something uh, synthesized, something shiny and human made. Uh, and we forget um, that the most sophisticated technology ever created is, you know, living within the, the mechanics and dynamics of our living world. Um, and I think that's something indigenous communities and especially women um, have been in touch with and are prepared to kind of offer some some leadership on in terms of you know that that great example of many examples of technology that are available to us. Um, if we want to look at technology that acknowledges, addresses, works alongside um, the the existing reality of our world um, and aren't trying to remake the landscape. Um, or or create a new world um, that is synthesized by human hands. But if we could kind of learn to go with the flow that exists um, and, and fit into it, fit ourselves back into it in the way that it was designed, um, then then we'd really be looking at um, something we could we could think of ourselves as really more sophisticated and higher tech ourselves if we were to do that. I think. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think I think it's important too. Uh, uh, as we say, all is not lost. You know, uh, uh, even Francis in his his document in that section um, points out. He says liberation from the dominant technocratic paradigm does actually happen sometimes. So uh, he gives an example when cooperatives of small producers adopt less polluting means of production and opt for a, a non-consumerist model of life, recreation and community. We, we can get together with each other and figure out a way, even on the small scale, that does make a difference. Uh, he's, he, he, he's very clear, he says, nobody's suggesting a return to the Stone Age, uh, but we need, need to slow down and take a look at what's going on and what's sustainable progress. And I think uh, that comes back to an economic model that uh, revisits the question of uh, uh, 
making stuff, using it, and then throwing stuff away. That, uh, that for a long time that was fine. It was you know, but I you know as you know if you look through the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, Goal Twelve is responsible consumption and production, finding ways to reduce, reuse, recycle in a model of the economy rather than, well, that's just for people who are motivated and they they want to fix their, their neighborhood. No, it's got to be everybody all the time. And it's not yet. Um, you can't separate technology from ethics and you can't separate the technology from the potential moral hazard of relaxing on the idea that uh, we'll, we'll solve it uh, even near us, this is I'm in New York, uh, maybe 30 miles away, is a decommissioned nuclear plant uh, up on the Hudson River called Indian Point. And there is a, a large conversation happening right now about how to do that, how to decommission a nuclear plant, who, which is still sitting on all the uh, waste matter from the plant that's been running for those many years, and you have uh, the plutonium, so to speak, sealed in caskets in pools of water awaiting transfer to where and how. And yet, not far away, I guess if you want to say far away, in Georgia, we're building another set of nuclear power plants. And of course, everything in nuclear now is totally beyond the budget many times over and also way out of sync with the calendar and the amount of money spent and then the amount of waste produced, there's been no real solution to that. We still do not have a place in this country to put nuclear waste. And the, the fact that we're continuing to build nuclear plants or talk about building nuclear plants without a destination for the nuclear waste uh, is past logic, unless you're just living in the technocratic paradigm where, well, we'll solve this problem and we'll get to that one later. And the later never comes. And even now, we, uh, there was a, a wonderful novel not too many years ago called Want Not. And one of the challenges in the novel, the, the theme of the novel was there was a man commissioned by some government agency to design the signage for a nuclear waste facility that would still be readable in 10,000 years, because that was how long the waste would be dangerous to humans. And the challenge was no modern language is the same after about 500 years. So how do you project 10,000 years in advance for a language that would be you know, decipherable to the humans who might still be here, please God, or maybe, uh, who would put themselves in danger by entering that space. Uh, by the way, the, he didn't solve the problem, uh, or we would have heard about it, but it was a good model of the technology that we have uh, is bumping up against a lot of realities, but we just keep pushing it out there on the long thing. Well, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. And we don't, we just, get, we just build more problems. So we need to really step back, step down, step away and take another look because that's not a model that's gonna really be ultimately productive for the care of the earth. And, and even when we have wonderful assurances from people like uh, Thomas Berry, who is a mentor of mine, who talks about the idea that uh, as Francis does, Francis says many times, the creator will not abandon us. No matter how desolate you might feel, the creator will love us and love us and love us. He will not abandon us. And Thomas Berry's framing of that is the universe will not abandon us. That is the universe uh, has with, been with us since the universe began. And we are actually the universe come to consciousness. So now you and I are the universe today talking to each other and realizing what's happening. And the fact that the universe has guided us through all the centuries, despite all the cataclysms that have gone on in the universe and certainly in this planet, and here we are, 
able to talk to each other about it and to care about each other, to love each other, to be present, presenting to each other and talking about these questions. That's a moderation of that same message that the Francis gave, that the creator will not abandon us. And Thomas says, the universe is not abandoning us. It's making us pay attention. It's waking us up, but it's not abandoning us. We are the universe. Let's stay awake. So on that note of guidance, um, maybe we could um, just take a moment if there's anything you'd, else you'd like to add kind of to sum up for us um, this notion of the, the intersection or the meeting place of climate change, which we know has disproportionate burden on women and girls um, and the effects of technology on climate change. Um, are there any other points or assertions that you would want to share with us about uh, the relationship between technological innovation and the work of building gender equity in our world? Well, I, I want to say, first of all, I'm, I'm grateful, uh, particularly to young women. Uh, I, I do a monthly journal called Carbon Rangers. And it's been, I've been doing this for about 17 years uh, to try to pull, to pull together the threads of, of what I see is happening on the planet in terms of uh, the climate change and threats to our uh, living on the planet and threats to the planet from the human as well, and encouraging signs in different parts of the world. And I, I did a project about uh, two or three issues ago, because I was struck by the fact that who's leading this charge? And uh, there was, uh, in the, it was in the uh, conference in, in Egypt, and there were four young women who were stepping up into that space and crying the alarm and saying, you're not doing enough. Now, obviously, the one everybody knows is Greta, who is a remarkable creature from some other dimension, it seems to me, that her presence and her status among these uh, people in the world who are trying to do something about this, she's, she's unassailable as a marker of righteous wrath and anger and concern and, and her love for the planet uh, next to other young women who have stepped up from different parts of the planet and her remarkable ability to say, I am from a privileged place. I don't want to be the focus for this. There are people here who need to be the focus. And she steps back even from those moments and says more and more of these others must step forward and lead. And I'm, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sort of embarrassed. I'm trying to think of when I was 17, what was I interested in? What did I care about? I didn't know anybody past the end of my block. And here's this, to me, a child saying, I'm looking at the world and I'm saying to the world, pay attention. And speaking fearlessly to, as we say, her elders, and most of the planet is her elders right now, uh, and saying, pay attention. And, and then drawing others to herself. Uh, I don't see the young men, not to chastise them, but I see the young women in every direction and in every possible mode of, of uh, engagement. Uh, that's encouraging to me. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, things like CSW will encourage more and more uh, young women to, to be unafraid. I don't think it's, it's, it's a, I think it's true to say that uh, there is reason to be afraid if you're a female person in many parts of the world, uh, that's just real. And to, to be unafraid and, or to be afraid and still step forward, uh, those are places that I think need to, to get a lot of our attention and a lot of our respect. And, and frankly, we need to emulate as much as possible. Great. Right. So on that note, we acknowledge you know, the challenges are real. Um, if we're being honest with ourselves, there's a lot of work to be done, long road ahead of us, um, but surely um, it is a road worth walking. Um, it's work worth doing. 
and there's good reason to put women and girls at the fore and, and, and listen to what they have to say in terms of what innovations will get us there. So thanks so much, Kevin, for everything that you've yep. shared today, all of your insights, your unique background um, that makes you know this interesting conversation in the midst of several different topics, um, something brand new out of um, several different areas that have been much talked about over the last several years. And uh, as we know, we will continue in this work by continuing in this conversation. So thank you for helping us take one more step forward in terms of our own clarity today uh, and for being a part of this uh, exhibition booth that we're offering and the context of the 67th Commission on the Status of Women. And so uh, with that, I'll call our conversation to a close and thanks to all for taking the time to listen. Thank you.